today we're kicking off a new series, uh, and again, if you're new here, we, we do series. We do a, a series of messages on a particular topic or study, and so today we're kicking off a new one, so you're here at the perfect time, and it's simply called David, the King David in the middle, in the middle, and it's a study of the in the middle years of King David, which is found in 1 Samuel 18 through 31, and so if you want to read along with us through this whole series, that would be great. Maybe take the month of June and just say, hey, I'm going to read this, I'm going to study this, 1 Samuel chapter 18 through 31, and here's kind of a little bit of the idea of what's happening. David was anointed as king, but he was not yet the king. Samuel, early on in the story of King David, came and anointed him as a young man, uh, not because he was the guy everybody thought he was going to be, but because God seen him as a man or a person after his own heart. And he was anointed as king, but there was this time between he was anointed and becoming the king. He was in the middle. He wasn't there yet. He was in the middle, and he had to maintain, and here's kind of a thought for us, he had to maintain the right heart and the posture in the middle so he could end up where he ultimately belonged. And so for us today, that's what we want to talk about. We're going to focus on this idea that in our own lives, there are times where we are in the middle of what we have been called to, but we're not yet there. And so many of you may be here today, you're in the middle right now. You're in the middle of a situation. We're going to talk more about what maybe some of those look like. And so we're trying to learn how to maintain the right heart and the right attitude in the middle so we can experience fully what's on the other side of this in the middle moment in our lives. And so hopefully over the next several weeks, I'm really excited about this, that God would begin to help us understand how to move through this in the middle moment that we're part of. And as I was studying for this whole series, I've realized that many of the great stories of scripture have an in the middle moment. There is a defining moment, if you will, that is in the middle of every great character of Scripture. There's this moment that they're in the middle of something difficult or hard or season. And for example, Abraham was in the middle of a promise that he had received from God and the actual reality of the promise in the son, Isaac. He was in the middle. There was a middle time and he had to maintain his heart and his posture before the Lord. Joseph was in the middle. He was in the middle in Egypt, much of which was in prison, but he was separated. He was alone. He was in the middle for 14 years until finally he came to the place where he realized this is why I was here in the first place. There was an in the middle moment. Moses was in the middle. He was in the middle a couple different times, but really he was in the middle on the backside of the desert for 40 years. Now, some of you are like, man, I don't want to be in the middle that long, right? <laughs> But he was in the, in the middle for 40 years on the backside of desert until the fulfillment of what God had been ultimately planning for his life happened. And there was some polishing, there was some shaping that needed to happen. And then go forward to the disciples. The disciples were in the middle for three and a half years. They didn't really understand what Jesus was doing, why he was here. And he kept even telling them, hey, I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to, I'm going to pay for your sins. I'm going to be resurrected. I'm going to go sit at the right hand of the Father. All these things are happening, but they were in the middle. They didn't understand it. And so there was an in the middle moment there, but also the disciples were in the middle for 120 days in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit. So this idea of being in the middle is throughout all of Scripture. And so for you and I to be in the middle, it's no strange thing. We just need to know how to manage it and maintain our hearts in the middle of all that. And so for many of us here today, maybe you're in the middle. Maybe you're in the middle right now. Maybe you've been there for a long time. Maybe you're like Moses and feel like you've been there for 40 years. And you're in the middle of some situation. You're in the middle of a storm maybe. It just seems like it keeps swirling and things keep getting crazier or things keep getting harder. It, nothing seems to be settled. I mean, you're just in the middle of a storm. Maybe you're in the middle of a difficult season. Maybe it's because of a death or a sickness or, or maybe your, your job's changing or whatever. You're just in a difficult place. Maybe there's a relationship difficulty. Maybe you're in the middle of a dream not yet realized. There's something in you that you know God wants to do, but you just can't seem to get there yet. And you're in the middle of waiting for that to happen. Maybe you're in the middle of a job change, some of you here. Maybe you're in the middle of a breakup. You know, that relationship that you thought was the perfect relationship and you thought the marriage was the perfect marriage and all of a sudden, boom, it just blew up. And you're in the middle of that. And you need to figure out how to maintain your heart and your understanding there. 
Maybe, maybe you're in the middle of growing up. Maybe today you're here and you've been in 40 years in the process of growing up and it's just taken a while because you're just like me, a slow learner, right? I mean, just, just trying to learn and you're just growing up. Or, or maybe you're in the middle of being stretched and it hurts. There's things happening in your life that are really forcing you to be something different. And you know you're supposed to be something different. You don't like it, but you're in the middle of that. And you're being stretched. Or maybe you're in the middle of being shaped into the image of God. I think many times the middle experiences of our lives, the defining moments of our lives, are actually ultimately in God's hand, Him trying to shape Himself in us. And so somehow I've got to understand that, Lord, even though it's difficult, you're still do something very, doing something very powerful. And so it's very important for us to understand that. Now, often I tell people we're in the middle as a church. You know, we're, we're in the middle. We're, I call us tweener. We're a tweener. You know, it's like junior high. You know, you're like, you're not really there. You're not elementary anymore. You're not really high school anymore. You're junior high. You know, we're tweeners. You know, we're a church of 400, usually on a regular basis. And, and we want to have great influence in the community. But really to have this huge impact in the community, we got to grow and become more mature. We're, we're tweeners in our leadership. We're, twe- we're just in the middle. And so there's some struggles there. And so what does all that mean? I think we can learn some things. There's a little Cantor's Law that I came across. I was doing a, a study for our board, and I came across this. It says this, everything can look like a failure in the middle. Anybody agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just everything. It's like everything you look at. Everything can look like a failure in the middle. And here's what I think happens. Sometimes we feel we're on the journey, and it's just not working. We just feel that way. We feel like we're, we're in the middle and it's not working. This is not going to end well. We just kind of get this, ah, what's happening thing going on. And here's what I think we need to understand. Stay the course, stay the course, stay the course, because you're just in the middle and God's not done yet. God hasn't put a period on the end of your story. It might be a comma. It might be a breath. God's not done yet. But many times it feels like, Lord, is it ever going to happen? I'm in the middle, and it's hard. Here's our key text, and it fits right into that thought. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, and we'll keep coming back to this again and again every week. It says this, and I, Apostle Paul is speaking, and I am certain, confident, I'm sure, And I am certain that God, can you guys all say that with me? That God, just say that God, that God, that God who began the good work within you will continue his work, his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So this ultimate idea of eternity with God is this big picture thing that he's talking about. But two thoughts real quickly from our our key text here. The first one is this is the idea of certainty, that we would be certain, that we would be confident. And really what that, what that means is simply this. It's being convinced that no matter what my circumstance or no matter what my situation, no matter what it is, so whatever you're in the middle, whatever that part of the story is your story, no matter what that is, that in life is or it looks like that God is still working. No matter what it is, he's still working. Even though it looks like it's upside down, it's backwards, it's crazy, it's a storm, it's a defeat. I mean, all these things, the only thing that I need to understand is that God is working and doing something. That God is still moving. That God is not a quitter. That God has not given up on you. That God is working behind the curtains of life, of your life, to bring us all to a place where he has prepared for us. That God is doing all those things behind the scenes, and many times we can't grasp it fully, but I know I'm in the middle, and that God is certainly doing something. I'm convinced of that, and I'm holding on to it. Here's here's a second thought from our key text, is I don't have to make it happen. So if you're sitting here today, and you're somehow going, man, i got to get myself out of the middle. i I got to do this. Really, it's not that, because it's God's work in you that actually brings you to the place that you should be. And so when I begin to allow him to do that, I begin to trust him to do that, then finally I begin to experience the things that God has for me in big ways. I need to trust him to make it happen. It says it's his work. So here's a couple things that are common to us all. One, 
is that we all have transitions in life. We all have transitions in life. We transition from being a little kid to, to an adolescent, and we transition from being an adolescent to an adult. We transition from being an adult to being an older adult, and then elderly. We transition through seasons, if you will. Transitions are part of life. And the study that we're going into, First and Second Samuel, covers nearly a hundred years of transitions. It's all about transitions. It's all understanding that life is moving and I need to somehow figure out that there's moments that I'm in the middle and there's moments that there's changes happening and it's just part of life and I understand it. It's common to all. I'm not going to fight against the transitions. I'm going to realize they're part of life. And so things like Eli in the early part of 1 Samuel to Eli transitioned to Samuel, the young boy, the prophet. Samuel transitioned to Saul. Saul transitioned to David. And then later on, David transitioned to Solomon. I mean, this transition process is part of life. And so for some of us, maybe it's from child to adult, from single to married. And David had transitioned from being the shepherd to being a giant killer to being in the palace. All of those transitions were part of his life. First thing. Second one is this, is what's common to all is that we are all going to face challenges to our call. I can guarantee you today that whatever God has called you to, there is going to be some shape or form of an obstacle to that call in front of you. I can guarantee it. I mean, I I, I can guarantee it because the enemy of your spiritual life and your eternal life with Christ does not want to see you succeed. And so he's going to do anything and everything he can to get something in your way or get you distracted or to get you off course. There's going to be a challenge to your call. And so I've got to understand that going in. There's transitions and there's challenges. And how we handle ourselves in the middle is critical to our ultimate success. So let's pick up the story, David in the middle, 1 Samuel 18, a little background the story of David is primarily found in 1 and 2 Samuel, but it spills into the Psalms and into 1 Chronicles. So if you read through some of the Psalms, some of the Psalms are actually David's cry before the Lord in the middle. He's actually in the time that we're talking about. He's crying out to the Lord, whether it be in a worship song or just in a, in a prayer or whatever it may be, as a psalm before the Lord. All of that's there in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel spills out there. The prophet Samuel, which I had already mentioned, had been the spiritual leader of Israel until the people cried out for a king because they wanted to be all like all the other nations. They said, hey, give us a king. They weren't happy with God's prophet. They wanted a king. And so God finally reluctantly said, okay, you can have a king. It's not a great idea. I'm going to give you a king. And he chose Saul to be the king. They anointed him. They appointed him. They put him in position. And for a while there, he was really good as a king, but then he got filled with pride and he became disobedient to the Lord. And the Lord said, wait a minute, you're not my guy. And so there was that transition, and a transition happened. God reluctantly allowed Saul to be appointed as king and disobeyed God, and David was anointed by Samuel to be the next king. And here's the problem. The problem was this. Saul was still the king. So he's anointed to be the king, but he's not the king, and there's somebody that's already the king. And so now we've got a tension. We've got a story here that is building, and David is in the middle. And we pick up the story after David has killed Goliath, and David was clearly under the Lord's favor, and King Saul, here's what was happening, was becoming more controlling, more fearful, more angry, more jealous of David's success. In other words, there was something stirring in him that was causing him to attack or go after David. So David's in the middle, and the very king place or the kingship thing that he's supposed to take on is actually coming after him to destroy him in the process. So let's just jump in. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 10, 11. It says, David was playing the harp, which I, I mentioned it to the worship team earlier this morning that all throughout the story of David is this idea of worship. That worship and getting through the middle is a big part of it. Later on in the service, we're going to worship. We're going to respond to worship and worship in song before the Lord. And many of us, the very pathway, if you will, to you finding your way out of the middle is through worship. So it starts out, it says, David was playing a harp as he did each day. But Saul 
had a spear in his hand. Remember, he's controlling, he's fearful, he's angry, he's jealous. And suddenly, he hurl, <clears throat> and, and he suddenly hurled it at David, intending, intending to pin him to the wall, but David esp- escaped him twice. And I just thought as I read that, wow, I would have bailed after one attempt, not waited for the second one. <laughs> right? I mean, two times. I don't know if it's referring to the second time later on in the story or two times that time, but there's this idea that somebody's throwing spears at me. If anybody's throwing things at me, I'm getting out of there, right? I'm not sticking around. But he stands there, and and here's a little spiritual principle. Duck. (laughs) Right? Keep your head low and duck. And there's just this idea that somehow he seen it out of the corner of his eye and he ducked or he eluded it or, you know, did the matrix thing. I don't don't know. Somehow he he was able to avoid getting caught in the middle of it. So he escaped twice. And so he's in the middle and the king that he's serving or playing for is now trying to kill him. Not only that, but he was also, the king, was try- not only was he trying to pin him to the wall, but Saul was trying to set David up for failure as well. So it wasn't just throwing spears. It was actually manipulation. It was control. I mean, it was all these different things going on at the same time. He was in the middle. Check out what it says in 1 Samuel 18, verse 17. It says, one day Dave- Saul said to David, I am ready to give you my older daughter, Merib, as your wife. But first, you must prove yourself to be a real warrior by fighting the Lord's battles, which, by the way, had already been settled because Saul had said, if anybody kills Goliath, I'll give you my daughter in in marriage. David did it. Saul didn't go through. And so he was disappointed, if you will, but he's still here in the middle with disappointment. And now he comes to him and says, hey, you know what? I'll give you my daughter if you go out and fight this battle. And notice why he was doing it. For Saul thought, I'll send him out against the Philistines and let them kill him rather than doing it myself. So he was trying to set him up for failure. So all of this is the challenge of the middle and the beginning of the middle years for David that we're going to study over the next several weeks. So how do you survive the middle? How do you survive the middle? For some of us here today, we need to hear this because the middle is very close to taking our lives, our spiritual life, our emotional life, our mental life. It, it, how do I survive this idea of being in the middle? And I believe in this first part that we're studying here today, that David had three major characteristics of his heart that made it possible for him to survive the middle and you and I. That there's three things, and I'm just going to hit them real quickly here today. So let me just jump right in. First one is this, is that David was faithful in the middle. He was faithful in the middle. That's what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 5. It says, whatever, whatever, whatever Saul asked, this guy that was controlling, fearful, angry, throwing spears, right? Got to get the picture. Whatever Saul asked David to do, David said, forget you, I don't like you. Right? No. Okay, just check it. Whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. He was faithful. All throughout the story, even after the spear throwing, even after the things that happened, he remained faithful, constantly that way. And so Saul, it says, made him a commander over the men of war, an appointed appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. So even though King Saul wanted to kill him, he remained faithful in the middle. He remained faithful in the middle. And for some of us, what we do instead is we go into rebel mode. It gets a little difficult. People start saying things, start going on, and and we just start swinging back, (laughs) right? We, We start fighting back. We start saying no, and obedience isn't part of our story. Rebellion is part of our story. And we go the other way. Instead of faithful, we're something else. And it causes more problems in the middle than helping it. Now, I asked the question, why would David and how could David be faithful to a guy like Saul? Right? Maybe you've got a boss <laughs> that you're thinking of right now. Or maybe you've got a situation. You're going, man, I can't respect them. I can't give them the time of day. I mean, you, if you knew what they did, I, you would do the same thing. But I'm thinking, how was David able to, in the middle, still maintain the right heart? And I just begin to wrestle with this, and this is why I think is the answer. 
that David's loyalty and faithfulness were not to a man. They weren't to Saul, but they were to a God who was ultimately in charge. David wasn't looking to Saul and saying, well, I'm going to be faithful to you because you're so respectful and you're so worthy of it. You're so all of that. He didn't do that. But he said he looked right over Saul and he looked to God and knew that God was respectful. God was worthy. God was all of that. And that's who I'm going to remain faithful to. But Saul just happens to be in the path. And so he was being faithful, not to Saul necessarily, but to God first and foremost. And maybe you have a boss or a spouse or a neighbor who makes your life miserable for you. And your faithfulness should not be based on their respect level, but instead on your respect level for God. So your faithfulness is not built on whether they deserve it or not. Your faithfulness is based on your relationship with the Lord. And see, so many times we we get faithfulness messed up and we think, well, they don't deserve me to be faithful. Well, it's not about them. It's about you and the Lord. And so that's what David was doing here. Now, this last summer, <clears throat> last actually it's been over a summer now, we were on a cruise, we got invited to go on a cruise uh, together, Jennifer and I, and there was a speaker, it was a Christian cruise, and there was a speaker, and he started talking about faithfulness, about consistency. And I'll never forget what he did, because he started getting into us, and maybe I've mentioned this before, but he just started talking about faithful, and he started, and he said, you know what, life is built on faithfulness, just being faithful. Faithful, faithful, faithful. Faithful in serving. Faithful in prayer. Faithful in your marriage. Faithful in in supporting the church. Faithful in in, in loving your kids. Faithful, 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 faithful. And you just be faithful. Just be faithful, 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 faithful in everything you do. Faithful. Because eventually, as you're faithful, 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 you become fruitful. You see, some of us, we miss out on the fruitful because we never stay faithful. And so I added a thought to it. It's faithful, 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 faithful in the middle, and eventually I come to breakthrough. Faithful, 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 breakthrough. And see, for some of us here today, we struggle to find the breakthrough because we struggle to be faithful. We struggle just to give it and say, Lord, it's all about you. I'm faithful to you, Lord. Even though all the crazy is going on around me, I'm going to be faithful because I know somehow, some way you're going to open up the door. First thought, David was faithful in the middle. Here's the second one. Second one is that David was humble in the middle. He was humble. He was humble. Now, I don't know about you, but if you take on a a giant in front of everybody throw a rock, poke him in the, in the forehead right here, and he falls down, you go over, and, pardon, but it's in the scripture, cut his head off and go, I win. It would be reason to be proud, right? It, it would be reason to say, I'm somebody. I mean, I matter. Not only that, but he would go out into battles and he would rout entire armies with just a few minutes, a few men. You would think if anybody could have been proud in this story, it would have been David, but just the opposite, because in the middle, humility is what the champion has, not pride. And so he had this humility about him. Notice what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 18. And what was going on is is David was reacting to Saul trying to trick him to receive his daughter in marriage. And here's what he said. He said, who am I? Who am I? It's a great thought. Who am I? Everything I have has been given to me by God. Everything I have, my breath, my life, my abilities, my gifts, my my opportunities, who am I? Everything I have is Him. He goes, who am I? And what is my family in Israel that I should be the king's son-in-law? You you get this incredible sense of Him bowing down and just understanding, hey, I'm not all that. I know I fought Goliath. I know I've led the armies. I know I've done these things. I, and I know that's happened and God somehow has flowed through, but I'm really nobody. And he was humble. And he said, David exclaimed, my father's family is nothing. And it's almost reading between the lines, but God is everything. 
Everything that I am is because of him, and it's nothing because of myself, and I take no credit for it. I don't try to say, look at me, or anything like that. And here's my point. For many, the reason we fail in the middle is we become proud and begin to demand our own privileges. We begin to say, I should get this. I deserve a raise. I deserve whatever. You just, you just fill in a blank and we begin to say, I deserve this. I deserve, I earned this. And it ends up happening when it doesn't happen is we make our difficulty our banner. We raise the banner and say, boy, I was treated unfairly. I was treated wrongly. Instead of staying humble, we start to go on the offensive and become critical or resentful or bitter or all these other things start happening because I wasn't humble. We make it our... We make it our our difficulty, our banner, and we let everyone know how unfair life is. We make it all about what I want and what I need, and we fail to realize God is doing something bigger than me. That I'm in the middle right now, that maybe, just maybe, I'm in the middle, and God's doing something really, really big, and it's not, hang on, about me. (laughs) That just maybe... (laughs) There's something bigger going on here. And there's humility and humbleness in the middle. And it's easy for us, and this is where it gets dangerous, that's because success does this. Success makes you begin to believe your own clippings are about you. And it says in the story, 1 Samuel chapter 18, that when David came back from one of his campaigns, all the women started singing a song, and they said this, you know, and I, I'll try I don't know how you'd sing this. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Right? I don't know. I mean, but they were singing this and Saul was hearing it and he was getting mad. But you know what? It was very interesting that David didn't take that song and make it his anthem. He didn't allow it to sink into his heart that he was all that. In other words, he pushed that away and said, the only reason that happens is because God made it happen. The only reason I have any success in my life isn't because of me, it's because of God. And humility in the middle is key to success. Notice what says uh, chapter 18, verse 23. But David said, do you think it is a small matter to become the king's son-in-law? I'm only a poor man and little known. I'm only a poor man, a little known. Let me, let me just kind of tie this to a thought that's in the New Testament that Jesus talked about. That an entitlement attitude will bring you down, but humility will raise you up. See, right now we have a big issue in our culture right now of entitlement. I deserve this. The world owes me. <laughs> and I'm just saying today that you might miss your in the middle lesson an opportunity because you think you deserve something when in actuality that might be catapulting you out of it or making the thing happen longer. That entitlement, here's what it says in Proverbs chapter 16. It says, verse 18, it says, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before the fall. And notice this, just because David was not in the position of being the king, even though he'd been anointed a king, he was faithful and humble as a true king. You see, some of us need to hear that loud and clear. Just because I'm not there yet, I still need to act as though God's still moving and bringing me there. That I'm still in the process of God doing that work in me and through me. I was, <laughs> do this real quick. Um, how many of you ever heard of the, a book called Tale of Three Kings? Two of, three of you? How ironic. <laughs> There's a book, and I just, I thoroughly, strongly urge you to get this book and read it. It's by Gene Edwards, Tale of Three Kings. First time I read it, it meant nothing to me. I read it, it's a little tiny book, you can read it in a day or two. It's about humility, it's about, it's a study on brokenness, and it's based on the life of David and his family and the situations that he went through. I remember reading it years ago and and didn't affect me at all. And then I, I had a situation happen in our first church plant in North Omaha. I had a couple that was doing things that were just totally outside the will of God. It was wrong, the attitude, it was wrong. And I was right. That's the truth. Right? But, but 
my attitude in the middle of it was wrong. And they were throwing spears. And I was pulling spears out and throwing them back. <laughs> I mean, and I brought them in. I, I brought them in, had a meeting with them, sat them down. And I had been to, uh, to you know, the, the throne room of God, and God gave me the right thing. And I was seeing it the right way, but my attitude was wrong. And as they were throwing the spears, I was pulling the spears out, and I was getting ready to throw them back. Sat down in a meeting, and I laid into them. It was wrong. I was wrong in my attitude. I was right in what I was seeing. I went off to a, a, a conference that week, and as I'm sitting there, the speaker gets up and he starts talking about A Tale of Three Kings. I'm like, wow, I read that book one time. He spoke for about three sessions on A Tale of Three Kings about brokenness. And I realized that as he was talking, I was the guy in the story that wasn't the victim, but I was the problem. Because of my reaction, I was pulling the spear out of the wall. It says that David, Saul threw the spear at David and he ducked again and he missed and it stuck in a wall and it says that he left it in the wall. But many of us here today, we don't leave it in the wall. So I pulled it out and I went back and, and some of you heard me tell this story. I went back and I confessed, confessed my sin to the, this couple. I said, hey, I'm so sorry. I was so wrong. I mean, just in my attitude, and, and I, I can't believe I you know, came across that way. I mean, I can. I, I was just being about me, and I was right, and all these kind of things. They cussed me up one side and down the other. I, I kid you not. Just blankety, blank, 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 get the blank, blank out of here. You know, right? I was like, whoa, that didn't go real well. <laughs> you know? And, and I look back, and fast forward, I'll just fast forward the story. Ten years later, I was speaking at a church here in Omaha, after I got done speaking, somebody came up and laid their hand on my shoulder, and I could tell they were crying. I was like, what in the world? And I didn't even want to turn around. They're like, okay, I don't know if they're praying for me or what's going on here. And I turn around, and it was the woman in that, the couple. It was her. And she's weeping. I'm like, okay. I turn around. And she goes, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We were so wrong, and you were so right. And in, even when you came and said that you were wrong in your attitude, we knew you were still right, but we, we didn't know how to react. And I'm so sorry. I've been holding this in my heart for years. And I thought to myself, you know what? The first chance that I had at it, I didn't have humility. I pulled the spear out of the wall and I threw it back. But the second chance, I came back and said, Lord, forgive me. And it took a while, but it brought me through the middle of that story. And see, some of us here today, you're really good at pulling the spears out and throwing them back. Humility. You've got to be humble enough just to kind of roll with it a little bit to see how God's going to work it out. Last thought. Last thought. So David was faithful in the middle. David was humble in the middle. David was alert in the middle. He was alert. It's 1 Samuel chapter 19 it says, then Saul sent troops to watch David's house. So, so the whole story's escalated. And now Saul is, is, had a spirit that, that came from the Lord. And actually, if you interpret it, I think the right way is that God kind of pulled his hands back and what was in Saul's heart came alive even more, right? He was open to, if you will, an evil spirit. And it says, then Saul sent troops to watch David's house and they were told to kill David when he came out the next morning. But Mikhail, I think, that's a girl's name. I don't think it would be Michael, but Mikhail. David's wife warned him, if you don't escape tonight, you will be dead by morning. Be alert. So she helped him climb out through a window, and he fled and escaped. Now, yesterday morning, I was here for Saturday morning prayer, and I, I just encourage you to be faithful in prayer. But as I was praying, and, and Jake, our student pastor, did a great job leading our devotion time, and we started out with, actually, he picked a psalm that David prayed and sang over this same story. And part of the, the psalm, and it's psalms, I'll give it to you, it's Psalm 57, verse 8, and there's a little phrase in there that I thought just caught my attention. It says, awake my soul. Awake my soul. May I be alert to what's going on. And I prayed and I thought about it for just a moment for us. And I thought, you know what? There's a lot of us here today that are sleeping in the middle. 
that we're not alert to what's going on, and danger is at the door, and danger is around the corner, but we're sleeping. We're in a slumber, and it says in the New Testament, awake from your slumber, awake, 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 that somehow we would be alert to what's actually going on. Three real quick things from this text that I think can help us. And I think this is the application for us today. Here's the first one, is we need to be open to advice. David's wife warned him, warned him, and too many people never survive being in the middle because they simply won't listen to advice. To survive, we have to be willing to be instructed. He did not say to Michael or Mikhail or however, whatever her name is, we'll call her M. He did not say, woman, be quiet. Don't you know I killed Goliath and people sing about me? He didn't say that. He listened. Here's the second thought, is to be aware of the magnitude of the moment. If you don't escape tonight, you will be dead by morning. If you don't escape tonight, you will be dead by morning. I have to be aware of the magnitude of the moment. He was not asleep at the wheel. He was not caught off guard. He was not ignoring it. And it says that he fled and escaped. And as I read through this, I kept thinking again and again, and some of you here in this room right now are in dangerous waters. You're asleep in dangerous waters. You're asleep in a place where you need to be alert in the middle, but instead there's a slumber. There's a slumber. See, and it's not a matter of you hanging in there. It's a matter of you making an immediate change. If you continue the same way on the same path, you will not survive being in the middle. Something has to change. I feel like the Holy Spirit is speaking to some of us right now. Some of you have been in the middle for so long that you've gotten comfortable with being in the middle. You don't even think about it anymore. You've just been there. You've been stuck, if you will, in the same place for a long time. And there are times, there are times that we need to stay and there are times that we need to go. Be very, very careful with both of those. I don't want to leave when God's will is that I stay. And many times the lessons and the opportunities that God has and is orchestrating happen because I stayed, not because I ran away. It's very true. Sometimes though, the lessons and opportunities happen when I go. And I asked the question when I was reading through this, how do I know when to stay and how do I know when to go? Right? How do I know? How do I know? Here's, here's what I came up with. If it's death of self or death of me, I probably need to stay. If it's death of self and death of me, it's just me and my pride, my arrogance, my entitlement, my selfishness, whatever it might be, that's what's bothered. I need to stay. But if it's death of my soul, I probably need to go. If my soul is dying or in jeopardy, I need to make some really radical moves. So whatever that might be, whatever that is, because motion is critical and keeping moving so I don't get stuck. Here's the last point as the worship team comes. Be ready to receive assistance says she helped him climb out. Be ready to receive assistance. Let me ask you a couple questions here today. Who are you letting help you? In the middle. Who are you letting help you in the middle? I know that for me, when I get in the middle, I'm terrible at having and letting people help me. Terrible at it. My pride, my arrogance, my, I don't know what it is, but I just don't, I, I, I back away instead of back walk towards. But who are you letting help you? Are you in the middle on your own? Is that where you're at? See, there's three friends in the story. There was his wife. She was a friend. There was Jonathan, he was a friend, and there's a beautiful story about how Jonathan gave him his coat and his clothes, signifying that he was really the one chosen to be the next king. 
He was a friend. He believed in who he was to be. He was there to support him and do all those things. Jonathan, his friend. And the third one is the Holy Spirit. There's actually a story in here. It says that Saul sent his troops out to go after David when he was with Samuel. And every time he'd send the troops out, all the people that he sent out would be overcome by the Holy Spirit. And they begin to prophesy and speak for the Lord instead of destroy David. He sent out another group. And the same thing happened. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. They had prophesied. And then finally he said, I'm going to go myself. And Saul himself went and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he prophesied. I thought, man, that is the weirdest story as part of this story. And then I realized, ha, huh, this is what God does. He surrounds us with people and he gives us the Spirit to protect us. He gives us the Spirit to protect us. So who am I letting assist me in the process? So as I close in prayer, heads bowed, eyes closed before the Lord. Some of you are here today and you're in the middle. And I just want to let you know that Jesus is the greatest assistant. (laughs) He's more than that. Actually, he's offering you and I an opportunity to be healed and restored and and brought through the storms of life and all the different things. Jesus, the person and the work of Jesus, he's the one. He's the friend that sticks closer to the brother. He's, He's the one that warns me. He's the one that fills me. He's the one that does the work in me. He's the one. And what I have to do today is I have to receive what he's offering. Just receive it. Say, Lord, I receive what you're offering. I receive forgiveness. I receive your healing. I receive clarity. I receive all the stuff that you have for me that I can get through the middle to what you've called me to be. Lord, I receive it. In Jesus' name, amen.